So as we mentioned earlier, today is a special day because today we're having communion together, but separately. And as I think about communion, I know later on in the service, Pastor Jeff will be sharing more about the elements themselves and, and the bread and the juice and what they represent. But even before that moment, even before Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, he did something incredible. All those disciples walked up in that upper room. They were arguing, they were fighting, and he washed each one of their feet. He even washed Judas's feet, the one who betrayed him. And it's incredible that Jesus did that. And even before the cross, we see just his huge forgiving heart. And so today, I'm here with Alicia Patterson, and I just want to ask her a question because there's something that she wants to share with us. Alicia, in your story, in your family's story, how has forgiveness played a role in any of that? Hmm. So as soon as you ask that, I can think of so many ways it's played a role Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have played if Jesus and the Holy Spirit hadn't have been helping me. But the one that I wanted to share with you today comes from my birth mother's family. She was killed in a car accident when I was three, almost four. And that death set off a chain of events that were understandably really hard for my family. And this is a story of unforgiveness and uh, mourning, grief and also of God coming in and making a difference and forgiveness. And so what happened was my grandfather was a pastor and he and my grandmother grieved the loss of their daughter differently. She wanted to talk about it and that as a general rule is women, they wanna talk about it, they want to explore it They want to give voice to their feelings. And my grandfather didn't want to. He just wanted to have some time alone. He wanted to go off and lick his wounds. And eventually, he took comfort in his secretary. And um, my Aunt Myrna, who was the oldest of the four girls and the boy that made up my mother's siblings, ended up being a psychologist, and she was in college for her degree at the time. Very sensitive, very great at observing things. And she had a clue and a suspicion, and then a confirmed suspicion, that her dad was having an affair with his secretary. And so she wrote him a beautiful letter and just pled with him, Dad, please, if this is true, please stop. Our family's already hurting so much from Marvel's death. And that plea fell on deaf ears. And he wrote her back or talked with her. He communicated, I am not. Bring it up again, and I will disown you. Well, you have no idea how completely different this was from how that family usually related. He was so warm and so loving and so broken and angry at God at the death of my mother. And so began a division in that family, a breaking apart from each other and from God. My grandfather and who was later termed for a while that woman um, lived in sin for a long time. They left the church, he left his family, but he loved my grandmother. So it was really messy for a while because he would come back and forth. And then you can imagine how the daughters felt about that woman. One got into drugs and alcohol. One was just dealing with life and some biochemistry that had been handed her. And my Aunt Myrna, she and her husband, he was an orchestra conductor and they were in Nebraska at Union. Um, They got further and further from the Lord. In fact, so far that eventually she ended up in radical angry feminism and then into kind of Wiccan. It was a new age, and I don't know any more about it than this, but it was kind of white witch um, goddess worship. Well, one time, um, she was the head of education for Nebraska. She was a really well sought after counselor um, and psychologist. And there was one point where she ended up alone on some property in Idaho in a little cabin, taking a break. And during that time, she 
perusing the shelves, came across The Desire of Ages. And she thought, you know, I remember liking that book. I, I think I'll take a look at that. And as she looked at it, it became clear to her that this was a powerful and wise woman. And she was so messed up that at first she thought, I, um, I think she must have been a white witch. She's so wise. There's so much strength in this. But as she continued reading, she realized this isn't a God that is a part of me, like I am God. This is someone other than me that loves me. There is a God and I am not it. And that became part of her healing. But at the time my grandfather um, was still out there, my grandmother sustained the death of her only son who died in a car, um, in an airplane accident. Her, one of her granddaughters who died in a car accident. And, um, and this constant wound of her husband. Um, I remember my father saying, for as much package as your grandma should have, she travels through life so lightly. And to be around her, she was joyful, she was loving, she had a cute sense of humor. But the point in time I want to focus you in on now is when my grandfather was dying in a hospital. At that point, my grandfather and the other woman, the secretary, had actually gone to a seminar, a revelation seminar at a Seventh-day Adventist church, had come back into relationship with God, had started attending church again, and had gotten married. And they had lived together for a little while in that state. But when my grandfather was dying, not only did his remaining daughters show up, so did my grandmother and the other woman. And in an act of grace that only Jesus sacrificed an example and the Holy Spirit's strength in their lives could have put together, they all sat in a little circle and sang hymns to my grandfather. And at one point, he looked at my grandmother and said, you have no idea what this means to me. And I've thought about that time and the forgiveness and the, the way that it continued, just like my mother's death and the distrust and bitterness and anger and infidelity and all that, that that set in motion. The forgiveness set things in motion. And um, that woman, who actually has a name, ended up, she never had children, just wanting to make amends and to be part of their lives. And she is part of their lives. And one of the daughters um, has gone close to her, and she acts as a, as a grandmother. My grandmother is dead now. Brings them things. And I've often pondered on the story and the grace in that room that allowed a broken and dying man to hear hymns and to see all of his loved ones in that room. So that's the story I wanted to share with you today. Mm -hmm. And the one that I thought of, Julie, when you asked me, do you know any good stories about forgiveness? Isn't that incredible? Just the first time I heard that, Alicia just brought tears to my eyes because that is something that only Jesus could do. Right. And I know that that has impacted you deeply. It has. So how about in your family? We know that you're married to Pastor Jeff and you have wonderful children. So when you think about communion and the Last Supper and all of this, what are ways that, that you experience that together that even maybe have some of their roots in what you just shared? So I am married to Pastor Jeff, so you can imagine I've never been angry and I've never had to forgive, and he hasn't with me, and our children are perfect, so I don't really have much of a story. Back to you, Julie. <laughs> well, I guess that's the end. <laughs> as you can imagine and know us, we're real people, and there have been many times when God has prompted me or him to forgive when we wanted to hang on to something. And um, I love, strangely, the act of foot washing. 
it's awkward. I don't love feet usually. But since I was little, I just loved the way that Jesus set that up. We've already been baptized, but as we walk through the world, we irritate each other and we get sin on us and we accidentally sin against or or knowingly um, or we hold grudges and we don't even realize they're there. And I just thought about that with the kids um, and one of our prisoners in Marietta gave us a beautiful set of dishes when we left. And really, we had done this before without the beautiful set of dishes. But we have a lot of Irish in our family. She gave us some Irish crystal dishes and some little Irish glasses to use in family communion. But I believe the first time we did this, I don't know that we had anything beautiful to do it in. I do remember that we used those brightly colored bins that I had labeled trains and airplanes and Legos and washed them out and brought them. And that's what we washed each other's feet in. Because I just thought, what if we didn't hold grudges for years? And what if even the quieter children had had an easy place to say, I feel like this when you do that. Or remember when you said this, and I could say, I am so sorry, please forgive me. God's still working on me, like we're still trying to teach you things, and I appreciate you bringing that up. So what we would do is we would have communion together, and then we would, in the little plastic bins, we would wash each other's feet. And I encourage them you know, we go around the room, do you have anything you want to ask forgiveness for or anything you need us to say sorry for? But then pair up with the person that you feel the most anger or irritation or bitterness or just distance from. And um, that's something we've done a couple times um, in our it, when they were younger and haven't been able to do. We're not together. They're away. And that I'm planning to do this weekend, and um, I believe we're planning to do this weekend from whom I've been able to talk with, and um, I don't know, that's just a really precious thing to do as a family, Mm -hmm. and this is like the perfect time to do it when we're all together and we can't even go and do communion here at the church. So that's been a really precious time that has helped us let go of stuff instead of continue to carry it. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that. That's very tangible. I can just imagine doing that with my family. It's it's a little bit um, in your face, right? But it's it's what matters most. And some of you are with your families right now, and you may have bins, even if they say trains and cars, <laughs> and, and you can use them right now to wash each other's feet. You may be by yourself. That would work, yes. or those storage bins. Good, all good ideas. You may be by yourself. But it's still a time right now where we can enter into this moment of thinking about the people in our lives and between us and God. And as we kind of go into that, is there anything else you'd want to share, Alicia, just about forgiveness or maybe what Jesus might be inviting us into in this time? Well, I was just thinking when you said, even if you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking how um, the psalmist says, ask God to search your heart and to know you and kind of shine the Holy Spirit spotlight. Even if you're alone, maybe you could spend some time and just say, Jesus, is there anybody that I'm still holding anger against? Is there anybody that when their name comes up, I just feel irritated or dismissive or just write out angry? Um, And in your families, in your friend group, Is there anybody you need to forgive? Is there anybody that needs grace from you? Because I know you need grace because you're human and I belong to your race and I know I need it. And I think it really matters to God. I think it matters to Jesus. They made such a huge sacrifice to do what they did. God to not come in and rescue Jesus and Jesus um, to so carefully let himself be persecuted and crucified. And we have this parable of the unforgiving servant. We have in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts or our sins or our trespasses, however you learned it growing up, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. I just want to have you ask yourself the question, do you want to be forgiven like you forgive others? And I just want to remind us how good it feels to forgive. We feel like when we forgive, we're letting down a boundary and we're just going to be trampled again. But that isn't true. What we're doing is saying, not it's okay what you did. It's not okay. If it was okay, it wouldn't be sin. If it was okay, we wouldn't have to forgive. What we're saying is, I trust you, Jesus, that when you said to forgive, that that will be best for me. I trust you, Father, that when you said, Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. That you are a good God. And it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever somebody plants, that's the kind of plant that's going to grow, and eventually it will be seen. It all comes down to a trust issue, just like just about everything else. Do you trust God to be the righteous judge? Do you trust Jesus to, when he said to forgive, and Mrs. White brings it out in the thoughts from the man of blessing, he doesn't want us to have that ugly feeling in our heart of plotting vengeance. He says, I'll take care of that, sweetheart. I'll take care of that, my son. You just leave that with me. And so those are some of the thoughts that come to my mind about forgiveness and about the relief that comes from not drinking poison and expecting someone else to drop dead, mm -hmm. from not locking yourself in a prison and, and somebody else may not even know, but you're suffering, but letting it go and just trusting and saying, I'm going to do what Jesus did and love anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love and trust God. I didn't mean I'm not going to set up a boundary, right? If it was somebody who abused you, you're going to need a boundary. But you don't have to carry a grudge. Absolutely. I think that's such a great way of looking at it and such a, a Jesus way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times we come here to church and we look all nice on the outside and we have communion. And it's easy to kind of keep things surface, to keep things sanitized. But today, we're all in our houses. So maybe we can be a little bit more real. Maybe you're in your pajamas right now. Maybe you're not. But either way, I know that our hearts are open before God. And as we go into a time of prayer now, before we eat the, the bread and, and drink the juice and, and celebrate Jesus' death in that way, I know that Jesus wants to have a moment with us just like he, like he did with his disciples washing their feet. And if you want to enter into that space, we invite you to, as I'm going to pray now, to just ask Jesus, as Alicia shared, search my heart. God, is there something maybe in her story that's striking a chord in my heart and in my story? Maybe something between me and you, a hurt, a disappointment, something that's, that's created distance or separation, or maybe something between me and someone else, and, and invite him to bring you into that place. He's not intimidated of it. He's not afraid of anything. And you're in your own house, so you can even messy cry if you want, and no one will know. True. <laughs> so I just, I just invite you to enter into that space with us as we pray together. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, what to say, God? You already know everything before we even say it. You know our hearts. And yet you're so kind. You're so gracious that you don't push. You let us tell you how much we want of you. You let us give you the green light. So right now, God, I'm giving you the green light. And I pray that everyone else here in our church here and our family wherever we may be is doing that too god thank you so much for sending jesus jesus thank you that before you died before you had this last meal that you washed judas's feet and god i don't get it it's just like how you wash my feet how you say i want to wash you clean i want to love on you even though you're not perfect 
And I know that even in that moment that you would have taken Judas and you would have loved him and restored him. Jesus, we don't want to hold back from your love. We want to experience your forgiveness. So wherever we are right now, I pray that you show us how much bigger you are than our past, than our feelings, than the wrongs that have been done against us, than the wrongs that we have done towards others, and the disappointments we've had with you, that your grace is big enough. God, please show us even right now, maybe something that you want us to give to you. Help us trust you enough to let you take care of it and to let your forgiveness heal our hearts and heal those around us as well. We love you, Jesus. We surrender to you. We open our hearts wide to you. We hold out our hands, palms up, and invite you to pour your love into us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Julie. I thought of someone while you were praying. Hmm. And just a new thing came to my mind, and I thought how good it felt to just give that to God again. And I pray that everybody listening thought of somebody and is just saying, it's yours, Lord. I forgive. <sighs> Luke chapter 22, verse 14, we find these words. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Those are pretty heavy words, and really of everybody in the room at that point, Jesus is the only one who actually knows what he's saying, because they don't understand what he means when he says, before I suffer. They don't know what's coming. This is, this is just before he's going to be taken. He's going to be betrayed that night. He's going to be taken. He's going to be crucified. But Jesus' language is very interesting here. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Now this is the, the this grows out of the Passover experience, and we don't have a Passover uh, set up here. We have something else, but what we have is what Jesus gave us out of that Passover context. The previous verses talk about how, in Luke it says, how Peter and John were sent to make preparations for the Passover and they made preparation. So this, this whole Passover experience, this, this ritual that, that God had given them was an important thing. And you were to invest in it. You were to spend time. You were to, to get all of the things together. Because to really get the most out of an experience, you have to invest in it. You can't just show up, oh, it's communion day, and then get the most out of it. No, the one who is the most blessed is the one who knows going in and has prepared. And this reality that we're in right now, where we can't actually get together, where you can't actually just show up and sit in your seat, and a, a deacon will bring along a tray, and it's got everything in there that you need. We're, we're not doing that today. We can't do that today. So in order to participate with this service today, it does take a level of preparation that maybe is a little more than we've normally done. It's interesting, the things that you invest yourself in to prepare for, to be ready for, are so much more meaningful when you actually participate in them. Are you ready today? I don't just mean, do you have uh, some sort of bread and some sort of grape juice around you, but are you ready on the inside? We spent some time talking about the foot washing and the preparations. But this is a moment. This is an opportunity in this moment. And Jesus looked forward to this moment. He said, I eagerly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. But then he adds this. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He would go through and he would give us this event, this this service that we call communion. Now, in some places, this service really is the most important event in the entirety of the service, and it's done on a weekly basis, and it's kind of interesting. You go into a church like that, and, and right in the middle of the platform normally is some sort of an altar that has 
uh, this kind of stuff on it. Now, we've kind of approximated that in a lot of Adventist churches. We have a little table down front, and on the front it says, in remembrance of me, or something like that. It, but there's usually not anything on it, or there's flowers on it, or something like that. But you know what we moved to the middle? We don't have an altar in the middle of our service. You know what we moved to the middle? We Protestants, and particularly I, those of us that come out of the tradition we're a part of, we moved the pulpit to the middle of the room. And we made the sermon the sacrament. Now, I'm good with that because uh, I'm a pastor, right? And I like to do that. But, but it's not healthy if I'm the only one or one or any one of us is the only one hypothetically, theoretically breaking the bread of life. That whole saying comes from a real service. And this is the real service it comes from. And this is the service that you get to be a part of. You should be willing to be a part of, even if we're not doing it at church. This is something you should want to do with your family. Jesus wanted to do it with his family. Well, I'm talking about that. Yeah, so as we were reading through, just through the book of Luke, looking at this time in our life and where we are and where... The disciples were. This was the very last time that Jesus was going to be with his family, his, the, the disciples. And now, like never before, are we getting a chance to somewhat experience what it is they were going through. There was fear. There was anxiety. There was no idea of what was going to happen next. There was a fear of the unknown, of the future. And in the room, you know, there, there must have been crazy tension and, and Jesus is saying these things, remember me, remember me. And right now, this whole world, there is a lot of fear, there's anxiety, there's fear for loss of jobs, uh, families not, not able to see each other. And right now, we're getting a little glimpse of what it is the disciples were experiencing during the Last Supper. And in these moments, with, if you're at home and, and you're taking part in this with your family, take a moment just to, to reflect on that. And it's interesting that there's two instances in Scripture where Jesus is about to leave or he has left, and people come together and have a supper. The first one is that we know of is in the Gospels with the Last Supper, and the second is in the book of Acts where he's, uh, he, has, he has left, and now everyone comes together in the upper room and eats. In these two instances is what we are called to do in this moment. And in those moments as Jesus is leaving, he tells us to remember. Remember the creator. Remember the one who came and died for us. And to remember him that in the moments of fear and anxiety that God is still good. So here we are in an upper room, if you will, because it's the upper youth center. That's where we are right now. And we can't always get in here, but here we are. This is the best we can do as far as an upper room goes. And we're gathered here to recreate this moment. Verse 17 in Luke 22 says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. These emblems that we have, that come from the Passover dinner, just a few of the emblems that were there, the bread and the... And and the wine represent the body and the blood of Jesus. And the beauty of this service is that it is an act, a physical act for believers to receive of the body and the blood of Christ. Now we understand it to, to not be in a literal sense, but yet in the same way, we do literally want the power of God to live in us through the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul spoke about this service, and this is the passage we normally read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So that's what we're going to do. We will pray here a blessing on these emblems and a blessing on the ones that you have. So I hope your preparations are done. I hope you have, you have your bread set out and, and you have uh, your, your juice set out and that you're ready because in a moment I'm going to say a prayer of blessing over the bread. Pastor Juan will say a prayer of blessing for the cup. And then after that, Oh, we will continue with our communion service. Now, we invite everyone who is a believer in Jesus to participate in this service. And, and as much as we can, we want to do this together. Uh, so, so please wait, and uh, we won't spend the time waiting for people to be served, because it's right there for you, but we'll give you a minute. And uh, then we'll take it and receive it together. And together we will, we will bear this witness of our faith in Jesus and our desire that the Spirit of God would dwell in, in us. So I'm going to pray, blessing on the bread, then Juan will pray over the cup. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you said that this bread represents the body of Jesus. When he was here, he took bread, broke it, and said, take this. We receive it in two ways. We receive it today in remembrance of what Jesus has done, and we receive it in faith for what Jesus will do. He will sustain us. In just the same way that food sustains our bodies, so receiving Jesus into ourselves sustains our spirits in difficult times. So Lord, I pray, whatever our community is facing, whatever each individual in this community is facing right now, and, and Lord, listen to everyone's hearts right now as as I know inside of all of us is crying out, this is my need, this is my need. Jesus, you are sufficient for our needs. So Lord God, let your blessing fall upon this bread and let it represent the fullness that Jesus is for us. And as we receive it by faith, may it empower us for living. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father God, we, we take this cup and we also do it in remembrance of you as it represents the new covenant, the idea and the, and the gift of forgiveness, God, during these moments where there's times of uncertainty and, and unfear. God, we take this moment and we want to spend it with you. We invite you into this place. We ask that you commune with us and may your presence be felt we do this in remembrance of you and what you have done, and we thank you, as Pastor Jeff said, in advance for what you're going to do in our lives. Mm -hmm. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So, he took bread, and I encourage you, take what bread you have now, and recognize, discern in this, a confession of faith that we believe Jesus is Lord. And as you have put your faith in him, receive this and receive strength for living. And so this cup, this cup which represents the blood of Christ, we do this in remembrance of him. We do this for the forgiveness of our sins. And it was not by, by force, but by the grace of Jesus himself that he put himself 
on that cross for us. And the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The words of 1 Corinthians 11 conclude, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is what you have done. You've proclaimed it as a family, as a group gathered. We've proclaimed it here. We've proclaimed it all around this place. And all heaven knows that you have put your faith in Jesus. And as you look at the cup, realizing that you've accepted the blood of Jesus. You have the chance right now to live in forgiveness. Pastor Juan, what does it feel like to live with your sins forgiven? Well, I think for me, personally, it allows me to, to take a step forward in, in a direction that I don't have to continue looking back. And one of the things that I think of is going back to what Paul says is where he says, I, I don't consider myself to take hold of it, but one thing I do is I forget what's behind and strain toward mm -hmm. what is ahead. And Paul says, I haven't figured it out. I haven't gotten there yet, but I continue taking strides. And to know that I have been forgiven allows me to shed that weight off of my back, move forward towards the goal, the prize that God has set. For me. I hope you heard those words, and I hope in your own heart you're able to take that step. Now, there's a fascinating thing that as you read the accounts in the gospel, one of the things it says that at the end, after they had had this meal, they sang a hymn together. You ever think about that? You ever think about Jesus and the disciples just sitting around? I don't know if one of them uh, played the lyre or whatever they might have played, and, or, or if they just sang a cappella. But it makes the point, doesn't it, that music is such an important part of worship. And it's often been the tradition in, in many of these services for the songs that we sing in various places in the service. But I hope that you realize that, that the things we participate in are such an important part of worship. And music is such a big part of that. And as we sing, I, I hope you won't just listen but you will sing together.